Hey everybody, this is Tracy here with another edition of A View from Tracy's Point. And we are back with the conclusion. I believe this is August 19th. <laughs> okay. Um, it is all weighing who is going to be testifying. But before we get into that, um, when you get a chance, I posted two other videos today. One is about Jim Derogatis trying to get out of testifying. He was um, subpoenaed by Daryl McDavid's team to testify. There was supposed to be an emergency hearing this morning at 9.45, but there was some mystery <laughs> event at the, they said it was an operations issue that closed the entire federal courthouse in Chicago, Illinois. So now that hearing is going to be held tomorrow morning at 9.45, where Judge Lennon Weber would basically tell Jim Derogatis whether he is required to testify or not. But go ahead and check out that video. And then I also posted the transcript reading of the Homeland Security investigator who reviewed and analyzed the tapes in the case. And you guys can check that out. It has also been posted. And then I have no clue who this all wing lady is but, or person is, but we are about to find out. So hold tight and I'll be right back. Okay, so it is um, the afternoon break, I believe, and the government, uh, Mr. Julian, you guys know, is the lead prosecutor on this case, and for those of you who are wondering what case I'm talking about, it is the United States versus um, Kelly McDavid and Brown, and this is a case being heard in the Northern District of Illinois. Okay, so let's see. Judge Lennon Weber says, please be seated, ma'am. Before you sit down, raise your right hand. Okay, so it is a woman. Um, the witness is sworn in, and then the witness says, I do. Lennon Weber, when you testify, please remove your mask. And then Mr. Julian, you may question her. And then Julian says, thank you, your honor. And if you're not familiar with me reading these transcripts, I will start off by letting you know who is starting, whether it's a lawyer or the prosecutor. In this case, it is um, Jason Julian for the government. And so he'll be asking questions. And then the person on the witness stand is named Betty Alwang. And she will be answering the question um, if the roles are reversed in which she's asking a question and he's answering. I will let you know at that time who's talking. But as we go along, if a question is being asked, it is the prosecutor or the lawyer. And if somebody is making a statement or answering, it is typically the witness. So, Jason Julian, um, good afternoon, ma'am. Hello. Would you please tell the jury your name? Betty Michelle Alwing. And how do you spell your name? Betty, B-E-T-T-Y-E, -T -T last name, A-L-L-W-A-N-G. So, Miss Alwing, where do you work? I work at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children sometimes referred to by an acronym? Yes, it is. And what's that acronym? NCMEC. Generally speaking, Ms. Alwain, what kind of organization is NCMEC? NCMEC is a nonprofit, non government child advocacy organization. And what type of work does um, the organization perform? Um, NC, I don't feel like I keep saying these initials. Okay, so the mission is to help find missing children, help reduce child exploitation, and help prevent victimization. So what are some of the ways that um, their work 
some of the ways that they work to prevent exploited children, for example. We operate numerous programs to respond to instances of exploitation when we become aware of them and hopefully to be able to help rescue and locate the individuals who need help. So can you tell the jury when the organization was founded? The organization was founded in 1984. And what is your role with the organization? I am the director of the Victim Identification Program within the Children's Division. What are your duties as the director of that division? I oversee the identification program, the staff, and our, and our daily operations. Okay, so what is the CVI program? The CVI program is the nation's clearinghouse for information on identified individuals and survivors of abuse material. Okay, how many people report to you as the director? Approximately 30. How long have you been the director? Almost two years. At a high level, can you just walk the jury through the chronolo chronology of the roles that you've had at the organization, starting with the most recent, your current one, and just going backwards? Sure, I currently, I'm currently the director of the CVI program. Prior to that, I was the program manager of Victim Identification Program from 2016 to 2020. Prior to that, I was an analyst with the VIP from 2007 to 2000. I'm sorry, prior to program manager, I was a supervisor from 2012 to 2016 and an analyst from 2007 to 2012. And prior to that, I began my career in 2005 in the call center. I want to ask you a couple of more questions about the VIP program. Does the VIP keep track of images and videos depicting CP? Yes. In what way? We receive submissions from law enforcement of copies of material that they may encounter through their investigations. We review that material to determine if any of the individuals seen within those files, those images or videos contain children that are already known to be identified by law enforcement. And we also look for any images or videos that contain minors that we don't know to be identified so that we can hopefully determine the location of where those individuals might be at, might still be at risk for further abuse. So in the course of your work at the organization and in the question rather, in the context, are you familiar with the term series? Yes, I am. In that context, what is a series? A series is a totality of known images and videos or images or videos that depict a victim or sometimes multiple victims. Are you familiar with the phrase hash value? I am. What is a hash value? A hash value is a digital fingerprint or a digital signature for a file. Okay, can two video files that appear visually similar have different hash values? Yes, they can. How so? If a video or an image is altered in any way, so if an image changes size or if a video is shortened, for example, that would change the hash value of that file. So does your organization keep track of videos and depictions of CP by series? Yes, we do. And how is the determination made by your organization that different files depicting CP, whether they be video or photographic depictions, that those files belong within a certain series? So there is two ways that we may start or create a series of the imagery. Um, the first is if law enforcement submits information to us indicating that they have rescued someone and let's see, rescue a victim of abuse material production. Hmm. They will submit copies of those files containing that identified victim into the program. And we will enroll that set of imagery and video as a series that we will then document and keep track of. 
So the second way is if our analysts, during the course of their daily business reviewing files that have come in from law enforcement, locate a set of images or videos of an individual or a group of individuals that we don't know to be identified, we will create a series for those files as well so that we can track them for hopeful location or maybe where that person might be at as i mentioned before where they might be being exploited so that we can refer that out to law enforcement for hopeful hopeful rescue so i think you just told the jury that if there is already an identified person and your organization receives files or video submissions from law enforcement that you would add those files to the same series already depicting that person. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So what I'm trying to understand and maybe help the jury understand is how does your organization make that determination that something is or belongs in a series if we're talking about an identified victim that you receive a submission and it belongs in a series that you already have going. Okay, the jury didn't tune that, I can tell y'all, because I'm about to tune out with this conversation. I think I understand what they're saying, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay, so it says, certainly, when files come in from law enforcement where we already know that the individual is identified, where they're indicating to us that the person is identified, we will compare those files against our recognition and identification system, or CRIS. That comparison has both a hash comparison as well as a visual matching technology and an analyst review of the files. So the files are then, as I mentioned before, kind of enrolled within our clearinghouse of information and documented as that identified victim. If future submissions come in from law enforcement where they do not know who the person or people are that are seen within the files, again, those files are compared against our CRIS system and the system does that same three part. Well, the system does the two part comparison and we do that visual review where our analysts are trained to be able to recognize and document those additional files as part of an existing series as well. So what I think you just said is that there are three parts of the verification process for when you make something a part of a series or add it to an already existing series. Is that right? That is correct. And you said that CRIS was a two-part process. Is that right? Yes. And just so we're all on the same page, can you tell what those three parts are? I think you said one of them is visual or manual review. Yes, that's correct. So the first part of the process is an exact hash match comparison. The second is a visual, robust visual hash matching technology. And the third is an analyst visual review of the files to confirm whether or not they are part of that series. So I just want to ask you some follow up on something you told me a little earlier, that if a video, for example, has been altered, it might have a different hash value, and that hash value is like a digital fingerprint. Is that fair? Yes. With a file that has a different hash value, let's say it depicts the same identified victim, would those files with different hash values be grouped in the same series? Yes, they would. And why is that? Because we group a series based upon the victim or victims that are seen within the files. Does NCMEC receive requests to determine whether visual depictions of CP are part of a series? In other words, do law enforcement agencies reach out to your organization and ask if a visual depiction is a part of a series? Yes, they do. And how often would you say that that occurs? Very regularly during the daily course of business. Is that a pretty much normal procedure for the organization? Yes, it is. How is it, how is a request submitted to you? Like, I mean, just practically speaking, how does law enforcement agency send something to NCMEC 
and say, tell us whether this is part of a series or not. Certainly, so law enforcement will submit copies of the material that they are requesting for CVEP review in through federal liaisons that are collocated at NCMEC. Those federal liaison, liaisons <laughs> maintain control of the media at all times. They make it available to the CVIP team who then are able to review that material. I want to ask you a follow up about something you told the jury earlier. Just a part of that verification process when you are determining whether something is a part of a series. You mentioned the phrase manual review. Can you tell the jury what manual review is? Certainly. So our analysts will visually review the abuse material that has come through in the law enforcement submissions to again see if any of the files are familiar to us as existing series that we are documenting and tracking. So those could be either identified series or again, ones that we are looking for, looking at for, Lord have mercy, the victim identification purposes. And they're also looking for any new content for victim identification purposes as well. So do you know why NCMEC uses manual review or visual review as a part of the process in addition to the technology certainly so one the manual review again our foremost mission is to try and locate content that might contain um, certain individuals that have not already been identified by law enforcement so we're going to visually review all of that content to see if there are any files, again, of individuals that we're not familiar with so that we can hopefully refer those out for a um, victim or rescue. And then we may also find files that are potentially new files that we haven't seen before but are of the same individual that we have seen previously. So those are a couple examples. And we've been talking about the term series or the phrase a series of CP. Just by way of example, how old or far back do some of these series of CP go that you are familiar with? The program started in 2002 was when we formally started documenting series. However, we do have series within our system that were produced well before then. So if we have, for example, the series that began maybe in 2002, can you explain to the jury what that means when you say it began? Is that when somebody started keeping track or is that when the thing, the depiction was created? Okay, when we talk about when we create a series, that would be when, the, when we document it within our system and start selecting files that have come in through those law enforcement requests for review as part of that series. So, could it be the case that NCMEC might create a series of CP in 2003, 2004, 2005, for example, and the depiction of CP was created before 2003 or 4 or 5? Yes. Could it be a creation of or a depiction of CP was created back in, let's say, 95 or 96 and it first gets submitted to NCMEC in 2010? Would NCMEC say that the series started in 2010 if you hadn't seen it before? Okay, we would say that we created the series in 2010, yes. Let's say you do have a series that starts back, NCMEC would say it starts back in 2005. Technology evolve, evolves over time, is that fair? Yes. Have you seen depictions that may have been created with analog technology like a camcorder that are later resubmitted to you in digital form? That can be. So for example, let's say you have a depiction that was created in VHS form and later on that same depiction is submitted to you by a law enforcement agency in digital form. With that later submission, would you classify that as a part of a different series or as a part of the same series? We would classify it as the same series. Why would you do that? Because it depicts the same identified individual. 
And would that determination be made in the ways that you described to the jury earlier on, that three-part process? Yes, it would. So it wouldn't matter whether it was initially recorded on a VHS tape or Betamax or anything like that. No, we review the files that come in from the original submission from law enforcement in whatever form that may be, indicating that those are people that we've identified. And then any other files that come in, regardless of the file type, if they contain that same individual, they would be added to that same series. So could that later file type be pictures like a JPEG? Yes and it will still be a part of the same series. Yes, that's correct. As long as it's identified the same individual. Yes, that is correct. In the context of your work, are you familiar with the phrase distribution report? Yes, I am. What is a distribution report? A distribution report is a list of the files, the images and videos that appear in previous submissions made into NCMEC during the normal course of business by law enforcement for review that depict that identified the person or that series. And what use does a distribution report have when making a determination? Submitted um, CP is or is not part of a series, an existing series. I'm sorry, can you rephrase? Yeah. So let's say you have a distribution report like you've just told the jury. It exists somewhere in your company's files. Does that report play a role at all if your organization were to receive a later submission in making a determination as to whether that later submission was a part of an existing series? So the distribution report itself would not. What would happen is if we received additional content later on that depicted that same individual, if we ran a new distribution report, then that would be reflected within that distribution report that there was additional files came in on that individual. Okay, so what exactly are the distributions that are listed in the distribution report? So the distribution report lists every instance of where law enforcement is submitting the copies of material into the program, where again, they are seeking to determine if NCMEC has any information on whether those individuals are already identified. So those are all CRIS submissions or child recognition identification system submissions made by law enforcement. So just to make sure we're on the same page, a distribution report is not a report of any time of CP is distributed somewhere or disseminated somewhere in the world. Is that fair? No, oh yes, that's fair. A distribution report tracks when it's been submitted to NCMEC from a law enforcement agency. That is correct. So who at your organization has access to distribution reports? The members of the CVIP program, are you someone at M NCMEC who has access to distribution reports? Yes, I am. Are they stored in the normal course of the organization's business? Yes, they are. Do certain NCMEC employees have to review distribution reports in the normal course of business? Yes. Are you one of those employees? I am. Have you ever made a distribution report? Yes, I have. Are you familiar with the series referred to as, so Bonjean, I'm going to object your honor and I'd ask for a sidebar. <laughs> so y'all know the sidebar is redacted and it is one, two, three, four, <laughs> It was four pages long, so they must have been arguing up there. So, so the judge says, proceed, and then um, Julian says, thank you, Your Honor. So he says, Miss Alwang, I think you said previously that you created distribution reports in the past. Is that correct? Yes, I have. Are you familiar with the series of CP referred to as the paneled room? I am. How did you come to be familiar with this series? Bonjean, okay, I'm going to object again, Your Honor. What's the name of the room? <laughs> Julian, paneled room, Bonjean. Okay, 
judge overrule. So Julian, I'm just going to spell it out so we're all on the same page. P-A-N-E-L-E-D capital R O O M. All one word, paneled room. Are you familiar with that series of CP? Yes, I am. How did you come to be familiar with the series referred to as the paneled room? I first became familiar with the files from that series in 2007 as an analyst within the CVP, CVIP. Do you know whether a law enforcement agency recently initiated a CRIS review regarding the panel room? Yes, we received a submission recently. And which law enforcement agency was that from? Department of Homeland Security, Homeland Security Investigations, HSI? Yes. All right. Do you know approximately when that was? I believe it was August 5th, 2022. So you got one fairly recently, a couple of weeks ago, is that right? Yes, we received that request on August 5th. Did you receive a similar request from HSI back in May of 2020? We did. Was that also related relating to the paneled room? Yes, it was. And what is the paneled room series? Just at a high level, it is a series of abuse material that contains a female of abuse material production. Okay. Um, you say that you became familiar with the panel room series bike as an analyst. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Could you just explain to the jury just in everyday speak how you became familiar with that series? Like, did you review images? Did you watch? Bonjean, I'm going to object on foundation grounds and where is a hole and there is a whole foundation amongst other reasons for the reasons I've already put on the record. <laughs> then the judge overruled. Keep going. So Julian, do you need me to repeat the question? Yes, please. You mentioned back when you were an analyst, you became familiar with the series referred to as the paneled room, right? Yes. How did you become familiar with that series? Yes, so during the course of my work, one of the tenets of the program is to make sure that we are aware of files that are distributed that are abuse material of particular individuals. And so at that time in 2007, I was aware of this particular set of files that contained this individual so that if I ever saw them in any reviews that came in from law enforcement, I was able to select them as that series. And you mentioned just a couple of questions ago that you received a request from HSI to do a CRIS review back in 2020 and again a couple of weeks ago. Yes, we received a request from C for a CRIS review and new series submission for those files. Did you generate a distribution report in response to receiving those requests from HSI? Yes, I did. So I want to talk just at a high level about the one from a couple, the CRIS review request from a couple of weeks ago. Did you generate a distribution report in response to that request, the one from a couple of weeks ago? I did. How, just how did you generate that distribution report? Yes. So we received the files in from Homeland Security Investigations indicating that these files contain the identified individual from the panel room series. I then compared them against our recognition and identification system. Bonjean, okay, I'm going to judge, I'm going to object, and I'd like to place my objection on the record. I mean, this is, and then Lennon Weber, go ahead. Bonjean, do you want, and then Julian said, do you want to do this at sidebar, your honor? Bonjean, do you want me to wait or then the judge? No, just go ahead and do it. Bonjean, put it on the record. The judge, yes. So Bonjean, okay. You want, do you want me to put it on the record without going to sidebar, right? And then he's like, yes. So Bonjean. Okay, again, this is an objection that I made based on a hearsay objection. And also, we don't have notice of this CRIS analysis that she's testifying about. She's testifying about a CRIS analysis she did. 
The government has not provided us with any underlying information about how the CRIS analysis was conducted, how this ultimately was determined. I don't even know what, frankly, the images she's talking about, whether it's related to this case at all, frankly. So nothing has been provided and it's all hearsay and there is a discovery violation as well. So I put it on the record. All right, overruled. You may cross-examine when the time comes. Go ahead. So Julian, move to strike the last comments about a discovery violation, Your Honor. Bonjean, I was willing to do it at sidebar. Judge, that's all right. Let's move on. Continue to ask questions. Let's get this witness through. Child, she boring me to death. No, he didn't say that, but she is boring me. But this is some interesting information. Um... I'm interested, okay, because <laughs> I didn't know anything about this little um, database. I've heard of the organization before. Um, I'm sure most of us have heard about this organization, but I never knew exactly what it is that they do. So, you know, getting this information, you know, I love learning new stuff, and this is um, quite interesting to me. So anyway... Julian goes on and says, can you tell us how you created this distribution report? Miss Alwang. And she says, yes, I can. When the files came in, I compared them against our CRI system in that three-part comparison process I talked about before. I visually reviewed the files, determined that they all contained the same individual as seen in the files that were submitted in to us as part of that submission indicating that they were that identified individual that came from homeland security investigations on august 5th and i was able to document all of those files as part of that series and then generate the distribution report from there now let me stick a pen here and point something out to you guys now she said she was first, she, the first series, the series was created. She was first notified in 2007, not in 2001 or 2002 when the video first, you know, came about out there. It wasn't until 2007 that she started the series and got the first information. And then they just now contacted her you know, with this refiling of this case, they reached out to her recently, um, probably to give her the updated version that uh, Michael Avenatti had then created for them. <laughs> so that's why she had to update the series. So let's go ahead on here. Because I'm thinking that the organization started in 2002 and all of this began in 2002. Why they didn't send her the information back in 2002? Why did five whole years pass before um, she was first notified about whatever it was that they had? So anyway. So it says, I was able to document all of those files as part of that series and then generate the distribution report from there. So you say you documented files in your distribution report, Ms. Alwang. Did you, did you, when you created that distribution report, list the names of the files in the distribution report as they were when you received them? I did not manually create the distribution report. It was created from the system based upon the files that had previously been submitted in by law enforcement and documented as part of the series. And those file names are in the report? Yes, they are. The file types are in the distribution report as well. I'm sorry, the types? Yeah, so the type of a file, for example, if it were a picture, if it were a video, would that be listed in the distribution report? Yes. And if it were a video, what type of file, for example, whether it was a .avi, .mov, .mp4, that sort of thing would be documented in the distribution report? Yes, the file extensions are within the report as well. Did you have to do any form of visual or manual verification yourself in order to create the distribution report? I visually reviewed the files pertaining to the series that were going to be documented in the report prior to producing the report or creating the distribution report. And so we're clear, when you say you visually reviewed the files, you had to visually review 
the video to ensure that it was the same individual as a part of the series? Yes. Do you know approximately how many reports there are? When I say reports, how many law enforcement submissions are there? Banji, okay, judge, I, first of all, there is no foundation for this and submissions of what? This is very difficult and I'm going to continue to object on notice grounds. I don't know what he's referencing and it's giving and she's giving opinion testimony that is improper that we've no notice on. Julian, well, Your Honor, she told the jury that a submission judge, she's not testifying as an expert, so I don't know what the notice. By Jean, she is though, the judge. I don't know if the information that she's talking about has been furnished to the defense. Julian, yes, Your Honor. Bonjean, no, it has not. Stop saying that. <laughs> Julian, we produced this twice. The judge, well, we're not going to go into discovery disputes. We've been through all of that. The government says it has. So, okay, well, I'd like a sidebar to show the court what they have actually produced. And it is not any CRIS analysis. The government has not produced this Chris analysis. Julian, your honor, I'd like to finish the direct of this witness. If there's a sidebar, some other objection not related to the form of a question, this isn't the appropriate time to have that discussion. This report has been produced in discovery twice. Banjing, the distribution report was produced. The Chris analysis has not. I want the record to be clear on that. Julian, she's telling the jury how she made this report, Your Honor. Again, these speaking objections, which have been happening all day today and all day yesterday and Wednesday, are not appropriate. They've been they've been not appropriate for a long time, and they're just lengthening the trial at this point. This isn't an appropriate objection. Um, excuse me, let me object because, um, Mr. Julian. You told us that y'all was going to be up there for four weeks presenting your case. And your case ended after nine and a half days. Okay. But anyway. So she ain't lengthening nothing. If anything, she helping y'all expand. Because I'm thinking if Bonjean was not objecting, um, the government side probably would have been done within a week. But anyway, um... Lennon Webber, he read to go. He said, let's just move on. Ask another question. So, Julian, I'm wrapping up, Your Honor. <laughs> so, he says, Miss Alwayne, do you know approximately how many times I started to say reports, submissions from law enforcement agencies? How many times the panel room series has been submitted to NCMEC as reflected in your distribution report? At the time of the distribution report, it was reflected in 232 submissions from law enforcement. Those submissions that we're talking about, did they come from different states? Yes, they did. So I want to ask you, for example, about the very first time that the panel room series was submitted to NCMEC. Would that have been submitted from a law enforcement agency in Maryland? Bungie, okay, Judge, this is leading. I don't even know what's going on here. This is improper. Talk about improper. So the judge, you may cross-examine when he's finished. Go ahead, Bungie. I can't cross-examine because I don't have the information, but... And then she probably wanted to say, but go off. <laughs> okay. So, Julian, uh, you can answer the question, Miss Alwang. Yes. Did you receive submissions from any submission from Wisconsin? Yes. Other places that are outside of the state of Illinois? Yes. I'm going to ask you some questions about what's referred to in this case as video two and video three. Have you heard of what we're calling in this case video two and video three before? Objection. Foundation with this witness overruled let's go on okay so i'm familiar with those file names from the submission from august 5th yes and that's what i'm going to ask you miss all wayne did you receive a submission from hsi regarding video two and video three yes i did were video two and video three included in your latest distribution report they are were they only listed one time in your distribution report 
I believe they're listed under two submissions, both from Homeland Security Investigations related to the new individual entry for paneled room. So can you tell the jury why video two and, vi and video three, at least in your distribution report, have only been submitted by HSI as opposed to the other entries for they are listed in your distribution report? Bonjim, I'm going to object to the speculation about that. Julian, she made the report, Your Honor. <laughs> the judge overruled. I'll let her answer. Go ahead. So by the witness, I can only speak to the information that has been submitted into NCMEC by law enforcement. And in these cases, at the time that I ran the distribution report, we did not have any indication that those two videos had been seen in prior law enforcement submissions. Julian, can I have one moment, Your Honor? All right. So then there was a discussion off the record. Julian, okay, I want to ask you, Miss Alwang, about your most recent distribution report. There is entries indicating a reference to video two and video three that we just talked about. Yes. Is there also an entry referring to a video one? Yes, there is. Is video one, as indicated in your distribution report, part of the paneled room series? Bonjim. Okay, objection. This is, I'm going to repeat my objections. This is just hearsay. And for someone to make that conclusion would require analysis. It would require opinion testimony, which has not been provided. Overruled. <laughs> So, okay, I get where Bajin is going because see, this is what I'm thinking as I'm reading this. And I'm no expert. I'm no analyst. Okay, I'm just reading this. Okay, It seems to me that Homeland Security sent this stuff over there on August 5th, a week before the trial started, to get it on the record so that they could bring it up in court. That was the sole purpose of them contacting her on August 5th talking about a video two and a video three and all this here so that they could bring this woman in here and be able to testify. So anyway, Julian continued and said, is video one a part of the panel room series? And then she says, when we received the submission on August 5th from HSI indicating that these files were part of paneled room. One of them was yes, named video one. And that is indicated within the distribution report. And that submission that you're referring to saying that that's video one and it's part of the panel room series. Yes. Did that submission come from HSI? Yes, it did. Okay. Give me a moment, your honor. Then there's another discussion Then he says no further questions, your honor. And then Landon Weber cross-examination. So the cross-examination begins. And y'all know Bungie jumped up out that chair so fast. She probably tripped. Okay, so she says, ma'am, have you provided your Chris analysis to the government? I have provided a technical assistance report along with the distribution report from the file review through Chris on the 5th of August. Yes. And the technical assistance report, is that the same as the distribution report or something else? A technical assistance report is automatically generated when we receive a request in from law enforcement. So it is always included within an analysis that we do. We would provide a technical assistance report as well. Right. Okay. And that's part of the Chris analysis, right? It documents the Chris analysis. Right. And that's something you provided to the government, correct? Yes. I provided a technical assistance report. Okay. And the series that you're talking about is that you've testified to involves one person, right? One minor, one young, one woman, right? Yes. Okay. And the videotapes two and three are essentially provided by Homeland Security in the last, I don't know, since 2000, in the last couple of years, correct? Yes. Okay. So how many, how many, how many videotapes or clips in total belong to this series? The distribution report at the time I generated it indicated how many different ones. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't under, can you rephrase the question? How many different video clips of this one individual victim as you've referenced it, how many different video clips are there? 
Uh, we have received 314 files pertaining to the series. Okay, do you know how many are duplicates or how many are this? Do you understand my question? How many different ones are there? I think I understand. There are the submission that came in from Homeland Security recently contained three different videos which comprise the panel room series. Right, so it's three videos and it's the three videos that make up this case, right? It's three original videos submitted by the agent, yes. Yeah, it's the video one, the video two, and the video three, right? Yes, okay. And when you were talking about all the other ones, those are just duplicates. It's just you are re referencing, right? Yes, okay. So, Bonjean, I have nothing further. Judge, okay, you can step down. Glusman, no questions, Your Honor. Judge, no questions. Okay, you can step down. The witness is excused. Call your next witness. <laughs> so I don't even know what the point of that was, y'all. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Miss Appentine then got up and she says, Your Honor, the government calls Jonathan Sinchi, Sinchi, I don't know how you pronounce it, C-I-C-H-Y. Okay, so the judge say, all right, how long do you anticipate with him? How long will he take? <laughs> so Appentine said, 15 minutes, maybe. And then he said, sir, please raise your right hand. So he was sworn in. So the child, the judge say, please be seated. Um, can you make this 12 minutes? No, he didn't. <laughs> he read to go. So thank you, Your Honor. So Jonathan Sichi, government's witness, sworn ex direct examination. So, Appington, good morning, good afternoon, sir, good afternoon. Can you please state and spell your last name for the jury? Jonathan Sichi, C-I-C-H-Y, and what's your job title? Customs and Border Protection Enforcement Officer. Is it appropriate to refer to you as Officer Sichi? Yes. Officer Sichi, with what agency are you employed? U.S. Customs and Border Protection on the Department of Han Homeland Security. And how long have you been with that agency? I was originally hired as an immigration officer with the INS agency in 2000. And then after September 11th, Department of Homeland Security was created. So I've been with that agency for 22 years total. And what are your... And can we call Customs and Border Patrol CBP for short? CBP, yes. Okay, CBP, yes. What are your roles and responsibilities as a CBP officer? My main priority as I investigate violations of law that happen at the ports of entry, inbound or outbound, any of the laws that we cover, we cover over 400 laws for different agencies. And I also review manifests for inbound and outbound flights to determine if there is any violations of persons or interests on those flights. And what is a hold on, what is a port or port of entry? A port of entry is anywhere that is a place that someone can enter the U.S. from outside the U.S. So you can have a land border as a port of entry. The airports are considered functional equivalents of the border because they are not actually physically on the border and seaports if the ship or boat comes from overseas outside the U.S. Okay, let's talk about airport ports of entry. What happens when an individual enters the U.S. by plane from outside the United States? They have to go through U.S. Customs and Border Protection. They'll go through primary, show their passport and get processed on primary. Then they normally will pick up their bags and then go through baggage inspection and then that's it. All right, is that process called a border crossing? Is that a fair? Okay, is there a database that you have that you work with as a CBP officer that you can access to that contains data about border crossings? Yes. And what's the name of that database or system? It's called TEX. That's T-E-C-S TEX. Text. Okay, okay. Now this is Abington. Uh, where does the data that is in the text database come from? It comes from many sources. It has the manifests that come from the airlines. So when you make a reservation, 
They will send that information to us for inbound and outbound crossings. There is visa information in there. There's many different systems that feed into it. NCIC for warrants. So there's a number of items within text. Okay, how do you generate a report from the text database that lists particular individuals border crossings in and out of the United States? There's a number of ways you can search. You can search by name, date of birth, flight number, port of entry, port of departure. So there is a number of different data elements that you can use to search. What is a text personal encounter list? Oh my God, it's basically a list of the results. If you've searched, uh, whatever criteria you enter, the results of what those crossings are. Okay, if there is any crossings inbound or outbound, and these are, again, data that's from the text system. Correct. And who has access to the text system? CBP, and then there are other government agencies that have limited access. In preparation for your testimony today, did you review copies of person encounter lists for individuals named Rishona, Valerie, who was Brandon? Was that the daddy? <laughs> what was that dad? Greg and Milton Brown? Yes. Now, there are exhibits that are right here on the ledge. If you could reach over and grab those. Mm -hmm. So I'm showing you what has been previously marked as government exhibit 343A through D. Yes. Take a look at those and let me know when you are finished looking through them. Okay. Now, are these the person encounter lists that we were talk just talking about for Rashona, Valerie, Greg, and Milton Brown? Yes. And are these true and accurate copies of official records maintained in the tech system? Yes. And was the information contained in these reports gathered and input into the text system at or near the time the border crossings occurred. Yes. Is the information in these records kept in the course of CBP's regularly conducted activities? Yes. Your Honor, the government will move to admit government's exhibit 343A through D and publish the redacted copies to the jury. Is there objection? Hearing none, they're admitted. You may publish. Okay, all right. Let's start with Government's Exhibit 343D. Do you see the clerk? Are you on PC1, Appington? I'm on nothing. It's PC1? Okay, so it's not published to the jury? Oh, not on that screen. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so we're looking at Government's Exhibit 343D. Do you see that in front of you there? Yes. Yes. Sorry, hold on one second. I need to switch to PC2 so he can see it. All right, so I'm showing you what has been previously marked as Government's Exhibit 343D. Do you have that in front of you and do you see it on the screen? Yes. Now, 343D, that's on the screen. The names of the individuals are marked off, but on the copy in front of you, you can see that this is... The report for Greg Landfair. Is that correct? Correct. All right. So can you, I'll make this bigger for you. Okay. You see this? I'd like to direct your attention to these rows. Can you tell us the jury where it says 2-9-2002? Do you see that marking right there? Yes. And based on the headings of this row and the information in this column, can you please explain what this column indicates? It's the crossing record on February 9, 2002 on American Airlines flight 5036 inbound. And looking at the next row down, reading those together in connection with one another, what can you tell us about Greg Lanfair's travel? Border crossing on February 9, 2002. So on this particular crossing, it is on the lower one. It is a crossing, or I'm sorry, on the upper one. It's a confirmation of Greg Landfair crossing and being confirmed into the U.S. From where and to what port of entry? The 50, I believe it would be Nassau, Bahamas to Miami. Okay, this line up here where it says 225-2002. What does this person encounter list tell us about Greg's travel on February 25, 2002? 
It's an inbound crossing on American Airlines 448 into Chicago from Cancun. Now, if you could take a look at Government's Exhibit 343C, which is in front of you, and again, you're looking at the unredacted version, is that a personal encounter list for Valerie Landfair? Yes, all right. So let's take a look at the crossing record for Valerie. On February 9, 2002, can you please tell us what Valerie's border crossing history was for that day? American Airlines 5036 flight inbound. It would be from, the flight would be 5036 and they were confirmed. Okay, looking at Greg's report, are you able to tell based on the report and connection where Valerie traveled from and what her port of entry was? Yes, it would be the same. And what was that? Bahamas, Nassau, Bahamas, Bahamas, Nassau, Bahamas to Miami. Okay, wait a damn minute now. Okay. If you take a look at February 25th, 2002, can you please tell us what you know about Valerie's border crossing history on that day? American Airlines Flight 448 inbound to Chicago from Cancun, Mexico. Okay, so I'm confused. <laughs> I know y'all tired of me saying I'm confused. So we know the jury confused. So, so on the 9th, they're saying that they came from the Bahamas into Miami. So did they fly from Miami to Mexico? And then from Mexico to... Why are they not talking about when they left the U.S. to go to the Bahamas? So... How did they get to the Bahamas? Why, why are we not talking about how they got to the Bahamas? Okay. Maybe if I keep reading, I'll figure it out. Okay. Anyway, so she says, if you take a look at Government's Exhibit 343B, you have that unredacted version in front of you. And she said, and is this a personal encounter list? There is actually two personal encounter lists for Roshona. Yes. Can you please tell us what Roshona's border, border crossing history on February 9, 2002 was based on her personal encounter list? So American Airlines Flight 5036 inbound Nassau, Bahamas to Miami. When did they go to the Bahamas? And again, for Roshona, can you take a look at 224 and 223? Sorry. 223 2002 and tell us what this what the personal encounter list for Roshona's border crossing on February 23rd I thought it was it okay anyway it would be an inbound crossing American Airlines flight 1638 from Cancun to Dallas and finally the last exhibit is 343a do you have that in front of you there Yes, and this is a personal encounter list for Milton Brown. Is that correct? Yes. So we're scrolling over to the third page midway down. So can you take a look at Milton Brown's personal encounter list? Can you tell us what the border crossing history for Milton Brown for February 1st, 2002 is? It would be inbound American Airlines Flight 5010 from Nassau, Bahamas to Miami. And then on February 21st, 2002, what is Mr. Brown's border crossing history? American Airlines Flight 2112 inbound from Cancun to Miami. Okay. Um, shouldn't the dates be lining up and he was flying on the same dates? I'm trying to figure out what she tried to prove here. So then she says, one moment, Your Honor. And then the judge says, cross-examine. And then she said, I just said a moment, Your Honor, if I could just confer with my counsel. Pardon? A moment, Your Honor, so I can confer with my counsel. Oh, okay. But I believe we are done. I think she realized what we just realized, that what she just said didn't make no sense. Um, because you're trying to prove that he sent them out of the country, but you ain't present no information about when they left the country. <laughs> 
I mean, that though Nassau Bahamas is just a hop skip. Like you could take a boat. <laughs> like they have um, boats that leave out of Miami that take people over to Nassau, and then you spend the day over there, and then you come on back to Miami. <laughs> but they flew from Nassau to Miami. And then they flew from Cancun to, I mean, was the trip all one trip? Did they fly home, fly out, fly back in? This didn't prove nothing to me. I didn't understand. This just made me more confused. And I guess that's their job is to confuse people and have people scratching their head wondering what they talking about. So anyway, y'all, she says she done. Thank you very much. So he's, the judge says, all right, cross-examine anybody. Um, Glusman, not from Mr. McDavid. Bonjean, nothing from Mr. Kelly. And then Kent. Yes, Your Honor. Um, you've got a customer, Mr. Kent. <laughs> You're so stupid. So he says, good afternoon. She said, good afternoon. And he said, you testified about a table of flight records just a moment ago. A table of what? Of flight records. Yes. You went over government exhibit 343A. Yes. Okay, there were 54 total records in that chart, in that exhibit, correct? I didn't count the number of records. Okay, if you could turn to the third page, it says total number of records. Could you read the number after that at the end of the table? (laughs) It says 54. Yes, thank you. So there were records for flights before 2002. Is that correct? Yes. And there were records for flights after 2002. Is that correct? Yes. And there were, let's see. Yes. Okay. Now turning to those 2002 flights, you have records for incoming flights from Nassau and from Cancun. Is that correct? Yes. But you don't have any departing flights, correct? (laughs) Okay, I'm glad it wasn't just me, y'all. It wasn't just me. Okay, he said, correct. And he says, for either of those cities, correct. There is not. So, just incoming flights, correct. Is it now going just above? <clears throat> well, let's see. Going just above that to some flight records from 2003. Do you see some flights for that year? 2003? Yes, there is. You have incoming and departing flights for Milton to and from Nassau. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And if you could just take a moment and go through the rest of the chart in the exhibit. I want to know how many flight records you have in total from Nassau in that chart. It appears six. Six of the 54. Is that correct? Yes, it appears that way. Okay, so you have records indicating that Milton flew to or from the Bahamas at least six times. Yes. Okay, and this chart only tracks international flights. Border crossings is what it tracks. Correct. Not domestic flights. Correct. It's inbound or outbound flights into the U.S. or out of the U.S. Not, no domestic flights. And it also tells if the person was confirmed or not. Okay. And these aren't, these records don't include if Milton left to or from Bahamas on a boat. Um, this particular records do not know. They're just flight records. These are, wait, hold on a second. Okay, flight records. So these are, yes, these are crossings, reported crossings by air. Okay. So Milton flew to or from the Bahamas or to or from Nassau at least six times, according to this chart. Yes, he could have been. Well, he is. He is listed on the manifest six times. I have to look if he was actually confirmed on the flight. So he could have not been on those flights. Correct. So he may not have been to Nassau or he may not have come from Nassau to the U.S. on that 2002 flight record that we have. Um, The 2002 flight record, the February 1st, yes. No, he was confirmed on that flight. Okay, so just getting back to what I was asking a second ago. You have six incoming or departing flights to Nassau for Milton Brown. Is that correct? Yes, manifest. Yes, correct. Yes, manifest. And that could mean that Milton went there more or less, more or less times than six, correct? 
Okay, and he could have also went there by boat, yes. And you wouldn't have records of that. It depends. Can you explain what you mean by it depends? Boats are required to report their inbound and outbound crossings. So if it's, for example, for instance, a cruise ship will have manifests from cruise ships. But if there, if there, but, but if there is, you know, small single engine boats that may not report their exit to us. But that's not what we have before us, right? We just have the flight records. Yes, this is, this is flight records. Okay, thank you. Nothing further. Anything further? Glusman, no. Bonjean, no. Judge, you can step down and we will also step down. <laughs> Witness excuse. And then Abington, uh, we have someone, Judge, pardon? Uh, we have someone. What? Your Honor, would you like us to call another witness or are we concluding for the day? No, we'll... <laughs> this man is so crazy. He said, no, we'll break until Monday, 10 a.m. And... Wait, hold on. Was that the end of the thing? They didn't close out the records. He said, we'll break until 10 a.m. And then he says, so, members of the jury, have a nice weekend. It's supposed to rain, unfortunately, but don't get on, don't go on social media and discuss your experiences. Don't talk to anybody. Don't read about it. Don't watch it on television. And then adjournment, 4.53 p.m. to 10 a.m. August 22nd. <laughs> so this judge is really over this case like the rest of us, and the jury probably is too. But anyway, guys, that's it. <laughs> That was just a way to waste of time because none of them people provided nothing worth listening to. So anyway, go ahead, leave your comments, rate the video, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And until the next time, I shall talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.